I'm Lauren James. I'm the author of many young adult books, including The Quiet at the End of the World. And today I'm going to give you a little creative writing activity that you can do from your own home. This is for anyone who's aged 11 to 18. So to start with, what I want you to do is go to your bookshelf and choose one of your favourite books, something that you know by heart that you've read loads of times. So pause this video and run and find one because we're going to be using it during the activity. I've chosen my own book, The Quiet at the End of the World, which I'm going to be using as an example, but I'd like you to use one of your own favourite books because it's really important that you're familiar with the characters and the plot to do this activity. So to start with, read over the back of the book, read the blurb, familiarise yourself with what's going on and who the characters are. So I will tell you a bit about this one. This is about the last boy and girl living in a time when humans can't have babies anymore. A global pandemic spread a virus across the planet and when it was over, everyone found out that they were infertile and so no more babies were born, which meant the human race was going to go extinct. The youngest people on the planet are Lowry and Shen, my two characters, who are going to grow up and watch everyone around them die of old age and they're going to be left completely alone on the planet. It sounds very depressing, but it's actually quite a feel-good story. So what we're going to do for this activity is take your favourite book and choose a page. So I am going to go for page 88. So if you flip through your book and find page 88 as well, I want you to read over the page on this side and on this side. So I'm going to read this as an example. If you don't have a book handy, pay attention because you can use the one that I'm about to read to you. The characters in my story, for anyone who doesn't know, are Lowry, who's a bit of a tomboy, she likes doing mechanics and digging up buried treasure, and Shen, who's a more of a night owl and he likes studying. They also have a friend who is a robot called Mitch, who walks along the riverside searching for people to rescue as a lifeguard. However, there's not many people around anymore, they live in the ruins of London where there's only about 300 people left, so he doesn't have much to do with his time. His communication device is also broken, so he can't talk to people, and the only way he can communicate is through a series of flashing lights of different colours. We're nearly home when Mitch flashes a bright crimson and hops from foot to foot. What is it? I ask, startled. Are you okay? Mitch signs something in a long series of coloured lights of varying lengths that are clearly instructions. I nod, pretending I have any idea what he was saying. Then he swerves across the sand like he's sniffing something out. Finally, he stops at a dip in the ground. His head swivels around a full 360 degrees like an owl. He flashes green at me in a way that very clearly means, well, come on then. I dismount my horse immediately. Even though I'm desperate to get home and change out of my wet clothes, I can't resist the call of treasure. He's found something, I tell Shen. I duck my head, eyes straining for any sign of incongruity in amongst the clay and stones and lumps of concrete on London's foreshore by the river. Shen retrieves his metal detector from his rucksack and waves it over the area. It beeps loudly. He grins at me and I smile back. The excitement of finding something is irresistible. Every single time my tummy flips. I dig at the ground with my trowel, prizing out a chunk of slabbing and a curl of plastic. Finally, I pull out something hard and round encased in a lump of clay. A chunk of soil slides away, revealing a silver necklace inlaid with pearls, caught on a tangled chain. I gasp. Mitch flashes a purple light of pure happiness. Have you been scanning for objects this whole time? I ask him. For years and years, whenever you walk along the beach? The lights on Mitch's head plate all flash green twice in a smug fashion. Shen's eyes go wide. You mean... He trails off. A laugh bawls out of me. We thought he was bumbling along, staring at the ground, but he was mudlarking, just like us. I stare at Mitch, seeing him with new eyes. How did I never realise how cool he is? Good bot, I tell him. That was very impressive. Mitch wriggles with glee. High five, buddy, I say to him. We make a good team. He holds out a claw hand appendage and I crouch to tap it lightly with my palm. That works, I guess, Shen says, not entirely convinced. You're just jealous, Zhang, I declare, standing back up. We're best friends for life now. My socks choose that moment to disgrace me by squelching obnoxiously in my wellies, which slightly undermines my smugness. Okay, so that is the scene on page 88 in my book. So what I'd like you to do is go through that page that you just read in your story and look if there's any words that you don't understand. 
we have the word mudlarking. So mudlarking is when you do exactly what Larry and Shen are doing here. You walk along the riverside with a metal detector, waiting for it to beep to find treasure. And it's called mudlarking because you're literally looking through the mud for anything that you can find. And it happened in Victorian times a lot when poor uh, orphans would go and search for things to, in the mud to sell. And they were the original mudlarkers. There's also the word incongruity. So it says, I duck my head, eyes straining for any sign of incongruity in amongst the clay and stones and lumps of concrete. So that means any discrepancy, anything that's there that shouldn't be there. She's looking among the sand for treasure. So next I want you to go through your scene and look up any words you don't understand and look them up in a dictionary if you're old school and you've got a dictionary or look them up on Google and try and understand what all the words mean. So next I want you to think about what's going on in the plot. Is there any foreshadowing? You obviously know the book you've chosen from really well. Is there anything happening in this scene which is you, you wouldn't notice if you were reading it for the first time but because you're a massive fan of the book you recognise that they're leaving you little clues for what's to come in the plot. Or does it make sense as a complete scene? In my scene, there's not much happening going on that seeds in the rest of the story. They, there's a beginning, a middle and an end. They find something in the sand and then they realise it's a necklace. That will tie into the plot later on, but for now, that works as a standalone little story. Next, I want you to think about the characters. So in my scene, we had three characters, Lowry, Shen and Mitch. Who is telling the story out of your characters? In this case, the perspective is from Lowry's point of view. You can tell because she's saying stuff like, I dig at the ground with my trowel and say to Shen, he's found something. So it's from Lowry's point of view and the emotions in the scene are hers. She says, a laugh bubbles out of me. I stare at Mitch, seeing him with new eyes. How did I never realise how cool he is? So we're seeing the scene through her point of view and getting her emotions about what's going on. If this scene was told from Shen's point of view, it would probably read quite differently. So have a look at your scene from your book and think about who's telling the story and why. If it's in first person where you've got a character like Lowry saying, I looked at the ground. If it's in third person where you've got a character saying, he looked at the ground, she looked at the ground it'll be a bit further back in perspective and you won't be as close to your characters. Think about how the author has chosen to write that story. Now, this is the time where you have to do some actual work. I want you to try and rewrite that scene from the point of view of a different character. So if you're following along with The Quiet at the End of the World, I want you to write that scene from Shen's point of view. Think about how he is feeling during those moments. Is he feeling the same thing as Lowry? Is he feeling something different? What is going on in his head? Remember, he's a very different kind of character. Lowry is a tomboy. She's very interested in digging up and getting dirty and doing stuff on the beach. Shen is a bit more thoughtful and studious. He's not as interested in getting his hands dirty. So how is he going to approach this task of searching for treasure in the ground? Is he going to be feeling as excited as Lowry or is he a bit uh, more nervous? If you really want to challenge yourself, I'd like you to try and write this from Mitch's point of view. What is it like in a robot's head? How is he thinking and feeling? He it must be very frustrated because he cannot communicate in words with Lowry and Shen. All he can do is flash these lights. So when he detects with his metal detector that there's some treasure buried, there's a necklace under the soil, he has no way to get that message across and he just has to hope that they guess at what he means. So it must be very frustrating for him trying to communicate that they need to dig in this spot. He's also very lonely because he's been walking up and down this river searching for humans to help. In a world where there's barely any humans, the only people he ever meets is Lowry and Shen when they come for a walk on the river. So try and write that same scene from a different character's perspective. Look at your own scene as well. Think about what characters are there and try and change it to a different person. Have a go at that, take about 10 minutes to do that and then come back and watch the rest of the video. All right, hopefully you're back with me and you've done some writing. Now I want you to reread the original scene that you've based your idea on. Then go forward and read what happens next. Does time skip forward into a point in the future or does time carry on from that point and you see what is happening throughout the rest of their day? What choices did the author make about where the story should continue and why did they choose to stop or carry on at the place they did? 
Now I want you to go back to your scene that you're writing from a different character's point of view and carry on doing something different from what the author did. So make different choices about what happens next in the action. If you have a story where there's an explosion, what if the explosion failed? What if the bomb didn't go off? How would that change what the characters do with the rest of their day? If your characters separate and they, they leave each other, what happens if they stay together and what do they talk about and do next? If they stay together for the rest of the story, what happens if they got separated at that point? Uh, and what do they do on their own? As this is your favourite story, you know what's going to happen and where this plot is going to go and hopefully there's lots of exciting action coming up. Think about what you could do that would be even better. Try and beat the original author. If you are me, what happens next in The Quiet at the End of the World is Larry and Shen go home after discovering this necklace. They go for a tutoring session with Larry's dad and then they clean up this necklace. Not the most exciting thing that could follow that scene. What if instead, after they find this necklace, Mitch steals it from them and runs off down the riverside holding this necklace? Do they chase after him? What if the necklace is not just a necklace, but it's a locket that opens to reveal a hidden parchment with a message on that starts a treasure hunt? Think about how you can make your story more exciting. Have a look over your original book. I'm, I know it's your favourite, but surely there are things the author's doing that you could do better, that you think aren't as exciting as they could be. That's what I want you to do now. Take those things that are boring or not as exciting about the story and make them better in your own version. If there's a really cool bit of exciting plot that's going to happen near the end of the book and on page 88 it's nowhere near getting started yet, how could you bring that forward so immediately after your page 88 scene something exciting happens that kickstarts the adventure? And remember that you're doing this from a different character's point of view. So choose a character who's going to be in the middle of the action and they are seeing things differently from the original character's point of view. Okay, pause this video and have a go at that and then come back. So hopefully you're back with me. So what we've done now is we've written two new bits of story. In the first bit of story you change the character. In the second bit of story you changed the plot or carried on and added new bits to the plot. In the third and final part of this exercise we are going to change the writing style. So I want you to look back at your original book and try and work out what kind of writing the author uses. Are they using first person or third person? If it's in prose is it a very uh, simplistic style with lots of action and not much detail or is it a very lyrical poetical style where everything is described really beautifully the quiet at the end of the world has lots of pages that are tweets and newspaper articles scattered throughout it it's not just solid text could you approach rewriting this story in a different format from how the author did it Especially if you've only got one character in your scene, maybe you could have them write a diary entry about what happened, thinking about it later on when they've learned more about what's going on in whatever their plot line is, and try and have them see that scene in a new light with new information. You could write it in the form of a poem, like a long ballad where lots of action's going on. It could be a newspaper article, or a diary entry, or any of these things I've mentioned. You could have your character texting the original character from the first scene on page 88 and telling them what's going on or writing them a letter. Anything that is different from what they do in the original book counts. What we're doing here is pushing the boundaries of how that story was first told by thinking about all the different ways you could do it yourself by changing the character telling the story, by changing the pace that the action happens at, and even changing the way the story itself is told. Everything that goes into making that story on page 88 appear the way it does is a decision that the author made about how they were going to tell that story. And what I want you to do is make different decisions and make that amazing story that you love so much completely new and different. So hopefully you found that a bit challenging, thinking about a story in a completely new way and really analysing the decisions that the author makes about how they're giving information to the reader. So instead of automatically going to the same character perspective, action style, writing style that you do, 
think about this exercise and think about how you can make different decisions and you don't have to automatically use what you're most comfortable in. And maybe the story you're writing has a different style that would work better for it. I hope you had a good time writing some fan fiction with me today and thinking about writing choices a bit more carefully. If you did choose to write From the Quiet at the End of the World or any of my other books, please do let me know. I'd love to see what you came up with, especially if you wrote from Mitch's point of view. I would love to read your fan fiction about Mitch. Stay safe and I'll talk to you soon.